Good morning. Welcome to WMB Church. My name is Sarah. We are so glad that you have joined us wherever and however you have gotten here today. We are glad that you are here. If you are new or just finding your way back to church, a warm welcome to you. We would love to shake your hand, but in lieu of that in COVID-19, if you look at the links under this video, you'll see one that says, get in touch. Click it, fill it out, and we will be in touch. What a great time to invite others to church, everybody. Let's do it. And you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can follow us on Instagram or Facebook to make sure you're getting all of the updates and all of the wonderful stories of things that are going on in our community and the way ministry is continuing to flourish. So share broadly, invite your friends. Let's find ways to be community, even in physical distancing. There are lots of ways for you to get connected and lots of connections we want to continue to foster. We had Tuesday morning break, our group for women meeting this past week online, and I know there are lots of ESL classes and many other ministries happening online. So stay connected. Again, if you go to wmbchurch.ca and click watch now, which you've probably done, you'll find ways to be connected to a home group, to our calling tree, to the other many wonderful ministries that continue to thrive in this season. I wanna highlight just a few events for you that we have coming up. Definitely, if you are a kid, a young adult, a youth or a senior, check out what those ministries are doing so that you can see the events specifically for you. Also, we have a Basics of Christianity class starting on May 6th. If you have questions, if you're wondering what this is all about or how to start processing some of those confusing parts of faith, we would love to welcome you into that space. On Wednesdays, you can always join us on Facebook Live to chat with Pastor Chris. He has guests, he has stories, and lots of things that are going on, and it is a wonderful time to hear updates about our community, both locally and globally. We can't wait to worship with you this morning, so let's get to it. In your space, whatever it looks like, figure out the best way for you to worship, to stand up, to sing along, to pour your heart out, to open your arms wide, to do whatever it takes to welcome our risen King. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to worship you now. We want to lift your name on high and know that our voices across the distance rise together to give glory to you, our risen and resurrected King. We pray in your name. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning. The Bible says, great is the steadfast love of the Lord. His faithfulness endures forever. Praise the Lord. We want to do that this morning. We want to shout for joy. We want to sing, great is the love of the Lord today. Let's do that. Love with the King of all. Shame and no fear, your love won't rise above 
every failure seems within your grave for love has overcome there is no fear and no shame in your love will rise above every failure seems within your grave for love has overcome This is the part in our service when we would normally invite up some prayer ushers, when we would take our offering, when we would have a few different ways to engage as a community. You can always receive prayer after our service in our prayer rooms on the links below this video, so we would love to see you there. For giving, we just want you to know that we are so grateful for the ways you have continued to journey with us, that the mission and vision of values of WMB Church haven't changed, that our staff and volunteers continue to engage in ministry in a way that brings the good news and shares the practical helps of Jesus, both locally and globally. Thank you for the ways that you are partnering and walking with us, whatever that looks like in this season. 
we want to thank you. There's a link under this video to click give and you'll find all kinds of different ways that you too can participate there. We're gonna go into our message. We're gonna hear wonderful stories of the way the gospel is just flourishing all around the world. We are going to hear questions from God, from Jesus, about how we are called into this mission with him. So whatever it looks like for you, whether you wanna grab a journal, settle back, make sure your coffee is full, uh, Let's get into the message. Let's listen to the words of Jesus and remember that he is the best news. Hi, I'm so glad that you've chosen to join us as we continue our series, Jesus, Life-Changing Questions. Jesus asks 173 different questions in the Gospels, not to gather information, but to get us to self-reflect and think deeply about the questions that he's asking us. Questions that get us to reflect on the really important things of life. Today's question is this, do you still not see or understand? Which at first glance in the pandemic that we're facing right now, maybe you're thinking, do I still not understand what God is wanting to teach me or for all of us to learn in the midst of what's happening? Whether or not God caused it or didn't cause it isn't the question. We're wondering, what is God trying to say to us in the midst of this? How does he want us to respond? Do we still not understand? But that's not actually the question that Jesus is asking us today at all. Jesus is asking this question to get us to consider uh, from a bigger context in crisis like this, when we're in need, who is our provider? Who is the one we turn to? Do we turn to God? Or do we turn to other things? Do we turn to ourselves? Do we expect that we'll be able to provide all that we need in moments like this? Or are we willing to turn heavenward and call out to God? You know, I've been hearing great stories of people from WMB doing some incredible things in our community. WMB uh, Barnabas Ministries has been giving away soup to people in our community in need of a meal. There's been grocery cards going out to people who are in financial need in our community and refugees who have come into the country and are in need in this season because they have lost work or aren't quite getting what they need in this season. I've heard of business owners paying off the benefits of their employees even though they themselves are going into the hole on a monthly basis. We've heard stories from our global partners around the world, like John and Jam, that are feeding 150 families in the slums of the Philippines right now, and how we as a church are engaged and involved in this by giving generously on a regular basis. Serge and Jen Kamari are also providing staples in Rwanda and doing some pretty incredible things as they go into their community and engage. Through the life of WMB Church, we see our church responding. I've also seen some great stories in the community. There's one particular story that stuck out this past week where a grocery store manager or owner caught somebody stealing at a store. And instead of turning him into the authorities and pressing charges, he gathered a bag full of groceries, gave him lunch, and said, hey, if you're hungry, come back and talk to me. I think there are some incredible stories of how God is using people to provide for one another in this season. When God provides for people, he most often chooses to use you and I. It's an incredible blessing to be able to give. In a time like this, when many people are hoarding and feeling the tension of food insecurity, there are many others who are not turning inwards. People at WMB who are turning towards our community and saying, we're in this together. We love you. God loves you. And we really want to help you in this season. I'm so inspired by the stories that I'm hearing from our community. I'm so proud of the way that we're turning outwards and 
seeing you living other-centered lives in the ways that you can. I'm seeing you do just that. The opposite, really, of human nature, that we are living out of the ethics of Jesus, of a love for God and a love for our neighbor. I see some people making headbands for nurses and medical staff and masks. I see some people baking cookies to say thank you to our first responders and the people on the front lines. I see people putting signs on their lawns and buying t-shirts. I see people delivering groceries and medicine and other essentials. I see people sharing their faith and sharing WMB videos and social media and just sharing a message of hope, faith, and love with others. I'm so proud and inspired by the WMB community living on mission together as we look to make more and better disciples together, continuing the mission of our church. Today, I want to turn to a story, to this question that Jesus is asking, because it's talking to us about provision. And I want to do that for three reasons. The first is that some of you need a provision miracle right now. And I want to talk to you about that. Some of you are the provision miracle right now for others, and I want to talk about that. And finally, I want to talk about this incredibly profound self-reflection question, because whether you're in need right now in this season, or whether you're the answer to someone else's need in this season, this text, this question that Jesus asks us today, who is your provider, is a profound question that can reframe and reshape how we think about what we're doing, regardless of the context. The story is found in the Gospel of Mark in chapter 8, verses 1 to 21. Before this miraculous provision story we're about to read, the disciples have experienced Jesus providing food and drink in amazing ways. Jesus churned water into wine in the four Gospels prior to this. We read a story of 5,000 men plus women and children who were provided for by Jesus. And I know that kind of is a cringeworthy statement to say 5,000 men plus women and children. In this story we're going to read today, it says 4,000 men plus women and children. And to say that is weird for us. And so let me give you a bigger picture, a bigger context here of how many people were there. Because for us to just say 4,000 men, that's simply not reflective of who we are as a church community today or how our society would view this story today. So I want you to imagine yourself at the Kitchener Odd, at a hockey game at a Kitchener Rangers game. There's 12 skaters on the ice and you standing at center ice. You have the five players on either side and the goalies and so they represent the 12 disciples. And as you look up into the stands, you see all of the people that are there. There are 7,131 people at the game. And as you look up into the stands, imagine the stands going up even higher the numbers actually doubling and the numbers of seats and you look up and you see all the people there. Scholars tell us when they say that there's 4,000 men present in the story, there was likely 16,000 people, including women and children. Can you picture the people in the stands? Can you picture people in the stands that are probably hungry because we have to understand that in this context, there were no food stands to walk out to and to get a bite to eat or to get a drink. The people were hungry. In fact, I would imagine that they might have been a little bit hangry. And that's the context that we're going into as we look at Mark 8, verses 1 to 21. During those days, another large crowd gathered. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. Now that's a long sermon. Jesus has been talking for three days. People have been listening to him for three days. Anyone would be tired and hungry without food or drink for three days. And I've got to say, maybe a little bit hangry. They are kind of hungry, angry, because they're tired and worn out. A three-day church conference without a break for a meal. And Jesus recognizes this and says, look, we got to do something about it. And so in verse 3, he says, if I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way, because some of them have come a long distance. 
And the disciples get a little defensive. And I want to explain to you why. But they say this, verse 4. His disciples answered, But where in this remote place can anyone get enough bread to feed them? Now you need to know that the disciples are starting to feel the pressure here. As they look up into the stands from center ice, imagine yourself standing there with them and looking at all of these people. And Jesus is actually expecting them somehow to feed them, or at least it appears that way. According to tradition, the rabbi would actually expect his disciples, those that followed him, to help provide for all those that were listening to him teach. And so in this context, clearly this is a, a massive crowd that would be expected to be fed, causing and costing wages that are just hard to imagine. In fact, as the disciples pointed out, they were in a remote area of the east side of the lake, and although they could have got some bread in Bethesda, it was a long way away and a long walk to come back with that food. It would have been impossible. It would have been at least a year's wages or more, and how would they transport it back to the remote area to feed 16,000 people? The disciples are feeling a weight of responsibility they can't possibly fulfill. They're trying to figure out how to bear it. They want to bear it for Jesus, but how could we possibly feed this crowd? I don't know if you've ever found yourself taking on a burden that didn't belong to you. I think right now in COVID-19, a lot of us at home can feel like we're taking on burdens that we've never taken on before. Responsibilities, maybe for kids or family members or for friends and neighbors, and maybe it's feeling a little overwhelming to you. We can feel like we're taking on a burden that doesn't actually belong to us. So Jesus asks our first self-examination question in this text. At a time where the disciples are feeling overwhelmed by expectations. They don't feel like they can live up to. Remember from last week, we said Jesus doesn't ask questions to gather information. He asks them to get people thinking. And so here is the first of our self-examination questions in the text. Mark 8, verse 5. How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. We already covered that Jesus has some expectations of them feeding, but he's not expecting them to provide for this entire crowd. He isn't saying, where is all the food to provide for this crowd? He asks them, what do you have to offer? What bread do you have? I'm not asking you or expecting you to offer what you don't have. I'm simply asking you to offer what you have. I think this is one of the most profound self-reflection questions for us in this season. What do we have to offer? Not what do we or others expect of us in this season, not what do others have to offer, not what should we offer to others, but honestly reflecting on what do we really have to offer. This is all Jesus is expecting of them. Can you Just take a sigh, a breath, with me in that revelation. Jesus' burden is light and easy. They were putting expectations on themselves and creating all kinds of anxiety and stress Jesus never wanted for them. Jesus simply asked, how many loaves do you have? They responded, seven, they replied. And this is important. And I want to explain a few things. Seven is the number of tribes of Gentiles that were with Moses in the Promised Land. We see this in Deuteronomy 7, verse 1. So they had enough for all the tribes of the Gentiles that were amongst them, not just for the 12 tribes of Israel. See, when they had fed the 5,000 men and women, there were 12 basketfuls left over, but now there were seven loaves of bread. Seven is also the Sabbath day, a time for us to rest from labor. Seven represents the Sabbath. So seven represents that God will provide for us when we rest from work. And these people have been resting now for three long days being with Jesus. And he's saying, look, I've got you covered in your rest. Seven was on purpose. 
again, a sigh of relief. We don't have to provide for everyone else in the midst of what's going on here. We just need to offer what we have to others, whatever that is. Continuing on in our story in verse 6, he told the crowd to sit down on the ground. When he had taken the seven loaves and given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people, and they did so. They had a few small fish as well. He gave thanks to them and also told the disciples to distribute them. Now imagine yourself back at the Kitchener Odd in the hockey stadium at the ice, and you're taking these seven loads of bread out, these baskets, and handing them out in the first row after Jesus has said grace. And you begin to pass them out. That's seven baskets around the whole hockey rink. That doesn't appear to be a lot of food. Imagine yourself sitting up way, way up in the stands in the nosebleeds, looking down at these seven baskets of food being passed out and thinking, there's never going to be enough by the time those baskets get to me, let alone a few rows up. And yet somehow as you're watching the bread and the fish being passed up the aisles, it's as if it's multiplying. It's as if everyone is being fed. So listen to what happens. Verse 8, the people ate and were satisfied. They were satisfied. There was enough for everyone to be satisfied after Jesus blessed it. They might have gave what they had, but clearly Jesus provided. He provided for all of the Israelites amongst them. And listen to the rest of this. Afterwards, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. There was not only enough for the Israelites present, there was a satisfaction for all of them and leftovers. In fact, the perfect number is left over for the seven tribes of the Gentiles that had come into the promised land with the Israelites. God wanted to use them to provide for others, not just for their own tribe and their own people and their own family, but actually for the tribes and the people amongst them. God's plan has always been to use his people to provide for others. Verse 8b, afterwards the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. There was not only enough, for them, but enough for everyone. Verse 9, about 4,000 were present. After he had sent them away, he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the region of Dalmutha. Then he left them, got back into the boat, and crossed to the other side. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed this with one another and said, is it because we have no bread? Amazing. They're still thinking that they're the ones that need to provide. They're still thinking that the pressure's on them, that the anxiety is all on them. After Jesus had showed that he could not only feed the 5,000 men and women, not only could he turn water into wine or provide for the 16,000 people right there in front of them, they still thought it was about them. So here comes our next self-reflection question. In fact, a series of questions that leads to the big question. Verse 17. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000? How many baskets of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered, seven. Clearly, Jesus is showing them that he is not only the provider of the Israelites, of the 12 tribes of Israel, but also for the seven tribes of Gentiles. That he is the one that will use whatever they offer to do miracles. It isn't dependent on them, but he wants to include them. There is a great blessing in being generous with what we have, with what we have to give. And really, this is the big 
final self-reclustion, he said to them, do you still not understand? Do you still not see or understand? The disciples were blind to the fact that God has provided many times already with bread. Don't they get he is the provider? They still think they have to do it. They often didn't understand, but WMB, I'm watching you understand. I'm watching you get it. That he is our provider and he's called us to provide, to give not what we don't have, but to give what we have. If you're in need of a miracle of provision, call out to him right now. We are calling out with you right now. We want to pray with you and agree with you. We encourage you to join us in prayer. If you're able to give and be part of someone else's miracle, and not just in money, but in encouragement, in love, in compassion, in time, give what you have to give and give it generously. But in either situation, do you feel he is your provider? Do you really understand that he is your provider? I mean, this is a profound question. It's a massive discipleship question. Jesus is asking you to understand the nuance between thinking you provide and give to God and others, and that God provides all that you have, and you steward what he's given you, sharing it with him and with others because it's all his. It's a nuance in our discipleship as we mature. Do you provide? Is it all on you? Or is he truly your provider? We live in a culture where normally most of us are unable or fully able to actually provide for ourselves. Maybe there is mental agreement that Jesus is the provider, but our gut felt experience, if we're truly honest with ourselves, is that God has given us the opportunity to work in a country, but we provide for ourselves. We're maybe well off, and so we can feel like we're earning the paycheck ourselves. We can feel like we give out of what we've earned rather than responding to the generosity of God towards what he's entrusted us with with the opportunities that he's actually allowed us to have. Some of us understand what Jesus is getting at here. You have experienced absolute poverty and need, and you know he is the provider, and you are so willing to provide for those that are in need right now. Or maybe you have needed a miracle of provision in some point in your life in the past. I know I have, and you have witnessed God come through over and over again. And so you know he is your provider. But I know there are others who have never really had to depend day by day for God to truly provide. He has provided, but they've never felt the release that God is truly the one that fully provides. Are we dependent on him? There's a moment to experience this for some of us for the first time in this season. For others, this is a moment to live into this truth again in our lives, to experience moments of rest from the ceaseless pursuit of production and productivity and allow God to provide what is actually needed for us and for others and to just offer what we have. No more and no less. Jesus is asking us this question today. Do you still not see or understand? God wants to provide all that you need. God wants to allow you to be part of his provision miracle for others. Give generously in time, talent, and treasure. Let's pray together. Jesus, you are the great provider. You are the one who gives all things to us. You are the one who has given us the opportunity to work, the opportunity to live in this nation and to have things provided for us that many others lack all around the world. Father, we know that you have been more than generous with us. If you never gave us another thing, your cross declares your generosity in a way that we could never repay. And so, Father, we know that we only give 
to you and to others in response to the cross, in response to your generosity towards us. And so, Father, we lay all that we have and all that we are before you and say, Jesus, would you use it for your glory, for your mission here and now? In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, amen, amen. Church, I'm so proud of how you're responding in this season. May you continue to live generously. God bless you this week. Turn your eyes upon Jesus Look full in his wonderful face And the things of earth will grow strangely dim In the light of his glory and grace Turn your eyes to the where justice and mercy embrace. There the Son of God gave his life for us, and our measureless debt was erased. Jesus, to you we lift our eyes. Jesus, our glory and our Turn our eyes to you. Turn your eyes to the morning. See Christ alive and away. What a glorious dawn. Fear of death is gone. For we carry his life in our veins. Jesus, to you. you find yourself this morning, can you hear Jesus asking you that question? Do you not yet see or understand that he not only wants to provide for you, but he wants to provide through you and that he is enough. He is more than enough. And he will join you on this journey. As you partner with him, we will discover so much of how he can offer himself to a watching and awaiting world. As you take steps of obedience, just like those disciples and say, okay, if you say so, and then recognize that he is the one who has done the work, incredible things can happen. And we look forward to continuing to share stories of incredible things that are happening around the world. If you would love some prayer this morning, we would love to pray with you. We have a prayer room on the links below. You can go there to experience confidential prayer times 
to be with people who can lift up your joys, your burdens, your concerns, your hopes, your struggles. We can lift all of those up to the Lord. And when church is done, we love to have a foyer and we definitely still have one. So we hope to see you there. Come, say hi, wave, see some friendly faces, have some uh, smaller chats and just connect together as a family. It is such a good and joyful place to be. You might even get to see my kids really questionable COVID haircuts. We would love to see you there and we would love to see you next week. Same time, same channel. See you then.